Um, Bartel has been one of the persons who's watched all the shows. Um, I talk to him on a regular basis in the um, EverQuest Next IRC channel. What we saw with, uh, you know, Kunark for, for EQ2, you did those 400 quests, you did all the content, and at the end of it, the world wasn't changed. Yeah, I'm Phantom Next. I uh, do social media and uh, write articles for EQ Nexus. For the fall of Bastion, um, there was a very definite, okay, this is this is where your story is going to fit into the, the world. Listen, fluffy looking bears. Thank you. Listen, <laughs> um, I went and I killed a dragon, and then two drops of whiskey hit my face, and I willed this manly beard into... <laughs> Cal was raising yours! Hello and welcome to Evercast. Hi guys. Hi everybody. Hello, hello. Hi everybody. Yeah, welcome to episode 16, The Legacy of SOE. Um, great show plan for y'all tonight. We're not exactly sure how it's going to go because none of us have really done a show like this. Um, but basically, you know, we're all gamers. We're playing SOE products. We're all interested in Landmark and Next. And so we thought it would be a good idea to kind of look back, um, look at their business models, look at where things have gone right, maybe gone wrong, and see how we've come to a point where we're at today with this really transparent, amazing company that is SOE. Um, so we're going to be a little critical in times, but hopefully we're able to mask that. And, and honestly, we are big fanboys, so I doubt it's going to be that critical. But we have uh, Dalman here with us tonight. We'll be uh, with him in a second. Other than that, I guess we'll kick it off to the eCast News. Hello. Uh, I was just talking to my uh, to my co-host. I'm going to have to surprise everybody with the eCast news because we were, we meant to talk about it before the show, but we didn't get around to it. Um, but we have the um, the the close of the alpha that is happening uh, tonight or tomorrow morning, um, where they're going to be shutting down the alpha servers, and they will be opening up the beta server for the closed beta test on uh, Wednesday. Um, when they do this, they're going to wipe all of uh, your progression. Uh, you'll be able to save your templates that you've saved. Um, when they open up the new beta servers, they're going to have new islands on them, and the new islands are going to have all of the biomes instead of having just a split of two of the biomes. Um, other than that, one of the big changes that occurred that I forgot to talk to my coworkers is that the um, limited time beta keys that the Trailblazers get, I think it's the Trailblazers, I, I'm not it sure. It is. No, you're correct. Yeah. It, it is. It is. Okay, so the, the keys that the Trailblazers get um, have been extended from being a limited you, a limited time key to an unlimited time key. So if you give your friend um, one of these keys to play in the landmark beta, the closed beta, they will be able to, clo to play it throughout the entirety of the closed beta. With that yeah, said... Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> with that, that said, <laughs> I forgot to mention it to my co-hosts, but we do have... Or we'll have some keys to give away. Um, yes. we, of yes. course, we want we want to be able to give them away on on Wednesday, um, the day that they actually have the most value. That the, the the day that people are going to be like, oh my goodness, I would like a beta key. We would want to be able to give them out to you. We don't know exactly how we're going to do that yet because we hate promising things that we don't actually physically have yet. Um, but stay tuned. And follow us on Twitch, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, because how we get that information out is going to be available in all of those different places. Oh, yeah. And by the way, soon, TM. <laughs> right. <laughs> I just want to say fantastic for SOE for doing this. I mean, they saw the instant negative feedback. A lot of people didn't really see that it was time limited. Um, I don't, maybe it wasn't there when people first bought it, but I know it was there later. You know, you hover over and it says it's limited time use, but they saw that negative feedback. They said, heck, people paid us $100. Why the hell not? Let's give it to them. So I'm very happy because now my friends and stuff can actually play with me for the duration of the beta because a week during this time, I don't think that would be enough. But um, we're going to be talking a lot more about that and the start of closed beta in our after hours tonight. So stick yes. with us. And we should also remember to give our vocal introductions for those of us that are listening on our our audio only that we have available for download. So hi guys, I'm Kyle Esk. Welcome to episode 16, SOE's Legacy. 
Hi uh, to those audio listeners. I'm Tanlin. I'm Chewina. Uh, hey. <laughs> and this is Flatus. And tonight, uh, Cal could not be with us. He was uh, terribly sick, and uh, he cannot be here tonight. So, uh, what are you wishes. talking about, Flatus? I'm here. <laughs> Didn't we? Say the worst <laughs> oh. <laughs> I thought we forbid you from ever doing that accent. I Please thought... say. Please send all hate mail to Chewina at gmail.com. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> no worries. Um, and so, uh, Chewina, why don't you go ahead and introduce um, our featured guest tonight? Well, coming at you all from the far corners of the interwebs, from the middle of Norath, the leader and main host of EQ2 Talk, a longtime member of the EverQuest 2 community, and an outstanding member of our community. SOE community. Welcome, Delman, to the show. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Very nice uh, things to, to say in here. Uh, uh, outstanding. Uh, <laughs> interesting description, but sure, absolutely appreciate that. Fantastic, mm -hmm. wonderful, amazing. Shall I go on, Delman? And he's a dwarf. And I am a dwarf, and as, uh, as folks on the video uh, feed can see, uh, I have a face made for podcasting. You know, I should so. totally crochet a door for you like I did for brass. Uh, the, 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 the avatar that I'm actually using is a, a it, Mighty Mug. We had a contest on the EQ to talk about. Nice. Where we made, That's uh, so awesome. made Mighty Mugs of each other based on something we had seen actually at SOE Live. And, uh, oh so my god, that, we should... That's the, uh, <laughs> that's the Mighty Mug that Allie made of me. That is so cool. And she, explain who yeah, Allie is for our viewers. Uh, Allie is uh, Allie or Alicia, is, which is her full name, is uh, my co-host on the uh, EQ to Talk podcast over there in Eland. You know what we should do? I mean, two seconds of our time. Not that this is terribly show worthy, but we should do mighty mugs of all the co-hosts. Would that not be so much <laughs> fun? That would be pretty cool. Oh, what, what, what's a cool. mighty mug? That's what Delvin is. It's, it's, a little, it's, a mighty yeah, it's like a little. It's clay, isn't it? It's a, it's a little. It's it's, it's like plastic. Vinyl? It's a it's oh, a okay. plastic doll. It's about six inches high. They come uh, plain white, and you can paint them and mock them I up. I see. And, okay. And she it's actually on, on on mine. She did a, like a full beard in clay and molded it and painted it. Uh, That's awesome. Let's be honest. I, I am not the most creative or talented arts and crafts person. So my mighty mug looked like it was done by a preschooler. And Pinabon wants to add that you're also very tall. Uh, well, in that picture, I'm about to, I'm about six inches high. <laughs> Is that normal mug, for I mean. a dwarf? The, the mighty mug, I mean, yes, yes. You guys are naturally short, I believe. Yes. Yeah, well, he's tall for a dwarf, people. Give that to him. Someone uh, posted in our chat, actually, just real quick. I thought it was hilarious because you said uh, the f face made for podcasting. They yes. said, it looks like Delman's been playing way too much uh, Landmark. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> you got the burn in on your face. <laughs> well, fantastic. I think we all um, have a couple questions. We're going to roast you a little bit, if that's okay. I mean, um, interview you. Oh, oh, okay, fair enough. Um, so, when did you start playing EverQuest? I started playing EverQuest, uh, I think around circa 2000-ish. It was, uh, I do remember, it was right after, or, yeah, right after uh, Velius launched, Scars of Velius expansion, and I said, why would I ever need that? That's for characters level 30 and above. I'm never going to need that. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's taking me six months to get to level 10. Uh, so, yeah, I came in I came in right around Rise of Kunark, or Runes of Kunark. I, I get the two uh, expansions up between EverQuest and EverQuest 2. Um, because some friends said, hey, you got to check this game out. It's just like playing D&D, &D, but online. This will be great. We can play at night. And I said, to heck with that. I am not paying a, for a game where I have to buy the box and then a subscription. You've got to be kidding me. I'm not okay, paying just... $15 a month. Yes. Uh, but I started looking at some websites. And I'm, wow, this kind of looks cool. And I bought it. And then sure enough, I think I've been playing every day since. A little EQ addiction there, huh? Uh, yes, just a little. I am truly ever cracked, yes. I would say it's ever cracked, right? I mean, yeah. that's what they call it. Yeah. How long um, 
you've been going to SOE for, live for a while. How long have you been going? I guess it would oh, be sh- called Fanfare back then, right? Yeah, it was, it was called Fanfare. Um, I think my very first one was... I want to say about 2003. It was like the year before EverQuest 2 came out because they were they were really hyping that and talking about it. Um, and you know, then I didn't go the following year, and I I really missed it. Uh, I really I said, wow, I really should have gone. And then I think the following year, and I've since been since ever since. So at least five or six years now in a row, I've lost track of them. Dang. And how long have you been doing EQ2 talk? We started doing uh, EQ2 Talk in May, June-ish of 2010. I had been doing a live cast about EQ2 before that, and uh, due to some, let's call it, creative differences, uh, I was asked no longer to participate in that. So we uh, we kicked off Eric, uh, EQ2 Talk and have been doing that ever since. We just launched episode 74 just a week or two ago. Wow, oh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank nice. you. We're, we're coming up on our Diamond Dang. Show. That's 70, insane. 70, 75. We'll get there in uh, yeah, yeah. a long time we'll from now. <laughs> How often do you do the shows? Uh, you know, I, I, the guys over at the uh, the SWG podcast, Star Wars Galaxies, their, their game, unfortunately, has sunset. Uh, but they told me one year, they said, if you can get past episode eight, you've made it. That's the yeah. magic number. Because there's so many podcasts that start up or, or, or live casts like this that start up. And I think people get is, is get into them and they're really excited about them. But then, as you guys can attest to, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, mm-hmm. and a lot of prep work and post work. And t- everybody's nodding their head as yes, they yes, laugh about how difficult it is. Um, and a lot of them don't make it uh, don't make it out of the starting blocks. Uh, so they always said episode eight was the milestone one. So if you've made it that far, you're gonna make it. Yes. <laughs> if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, folks. Absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. Anyone else have any questions for Delman? Hey, Delman. Um, your favorite class and why in EQ2? Uh, easy, easy. Uh, cleric. Well, Templar. Um, because I, I, I had always played the healer in pen and paper D&D, and I had always played the dwarf. And I always whenever... played the healer, too. Yeah, so, so that's why I was in, in, in EverQuest. And whenever Quest 2 came along, I said, maybe I should try something different. These Vertongas look really cool. But then I'm like, nope, I'm going to stick to what I am. I switched my name around. It, I was Mondell in, in EQ. Switched that around, became Delmon. And started out as a Dwarven, well, Dwarven Priest. And then you become a Cleric and then a Templar. All that's long since changed. But uh, <laughs> yes. since, since day one, Dwarven Healer. You know, I must say, you probably should have stuck with Mondell. You could be a great R&B artist with that kind of name. Uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good, Mondell. And for, for folks who don't know, uh, Mondell is actually short for Del Monitor. That's where my name came from. You it are came kidding, from, Del Monitor. Uh, it really came from Del Monitor. And then when I came to uh, EQ2, I switched it around and made it Del Mon. Wow. That's a little tidbit for you guys right there. That, that's a Del fascinating. Monitor. I would be, if we did it that way, I would be Acer Mon. All my characters are named after things on my desk. Um, oh my god! Like Moopa, which is mouse pad, <laughs> or, uh, or Pole Spry, which is Pole and Springs water bottle. What? All my characters are named after things on my desk. You know, I've never thought of doing that before, but it's actually well, a great idea. Everybody's got their you... themes, and mine is just that. <laughs> I mean, we we should do a show and, and explain where we got our character names from, because I don't think we've ever talked about that. Yeah, maybe we can visit in the after hours today. Yeah, yeah, let's, we'll come yeah. back to it. It's pretty interesting. That's actually kind of cool. Yeah, we should totally do that. I don't think anything's going to beat Moopa. <laughs> no, I don't think no, so <laughs> what, what class does Moopa play exactly? Uh, Moopa is a... Uh, I, you know, I really don't have alts. I'm, I'm not an alt guy. They're more like mules, guys who stand around by the bank and hold things for me. Yes. Uh, but Moopa might be a... Uh, uh, a shaman. You know, he I sounds think. like a real button clicker. Uh, yeah, he, uh, <laughs> I think he's an ogre. Or that might be Vanilco, which was uh, a Yankee candle, a uh, vanilla cookie Yankee candle. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Well, now that you know that's all, what's on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. So I'm not the only person that keeps candles on their desk. In case the power goes out? No, it gets rid of the, uh, the 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 guy gamer smell. Oh, okay. Are you saying that 
saying that I smell. <laughs> Go like a guy gamer. <laughs> like a boy. Sorry. And Delman goes quiet. <laughs> I, 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 He's a smart man. I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Um, thanks for joining us. We, we, um, we definitely love having you on. And you're welcome to come back anytime, depending on how the end of the episode goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not make promises we can't commit to later, right? You're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't want to be like that podcast. At the end of the episode, we'll just replace Chad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you don't want to replace me. Look at this. My mom picked this up for me. And that's just how amazing of a, a family we are. Look at this. Dragon head. How cool is that? And... <laughs> <laughs> like, Says the pantless wonder. Yeah. Do you, whoa, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Do you, do you like walk around the house, go behind your fiance, going, hey? Without would... pants, yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, we actually have kind of a more serious topic planned for tonight. Um, do you guys want to go ahead and start kicking that off? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I'm waiting for Chad to. to start talking about that to be honest um so really really quick on on that note um because caliber won't be joining us um, and he was sort of our resident expert on uh, star wars galaxies i only played very very briefly and i didn't play until after the game was broke by sony so i really can't say a whole lot about galaxies unfortunately um now if my friend were here he could talk the entire hour and then another two or three about it um so we might have to skip touching too much on galaxies at least for me yeah i'll just go with the basic generic history on that but if anyone wants to chime in and chat that's perfectly okay so um we have a little video to play because you know let's establish a little rapport of why soe is who they are and I think it's a little video that they showed back at E3 that kind of encapsulates just how big the EverQuest franchise has become, and with that SOE. So, can we go ahead and roll that, Tamla? Loading. Please wait. I should have given him more heads up, I think. Maybe. I got Maybe. it. It's playing. <laughs> All right. Hey, that was a pretty sweet video. The numbers always astound me. I think that's the, the biggest thing. Like, oh, the 179th country in the world, or 400,000 NPCs in EverQuest. Uh, the, uh, crazy numbers. The spells. What is it? 30, 62,000? Or 30, my dyslexia is getting to me a little bit there. Too many. A hell of a lot. <laughs> hell of a lot. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of show that video just to kind of establish where we are today. Um, 
from something that started back in the 90s. A quick recap of like early history. You have Verant Interactive, you have 989 Studios. They were both working on different projects as like different little parts of Sony. Um, I believe 989 Studios was like the RTS side of it. They did like Tarnus, Tarnus online, Tarnus, whatever. Um, and then Verant was working on EverQuest, I believe. And then they kind of got consumed into one entity by Sony. They were all kind of like Sony little subsidies, um, but they all kind of came together. John Smiley became CEO. Um, we have Brad McQuaid, who was lead designer with him on the EverQuest project. And it was really EverQuest that kind of created the possibility for SOE to become what it was. It, it really established, hey, we have this awesome product. It, it won an Emmy in like 2008, didn't it? Some really cool stuff. Um, but so... We kind of have this two-staged approach um, to how we're going to be doing this show tonight. We're going to be looking at it in eras, and then we're going to be looking at it by its, its kind of problems and then its positives for the era. So we have the subscription model era of SOE, and then we kind of move into the move to free-to-play and where we are today. Um, so let's start off with problems of this era, and I believe there are a lot because this is an... It's kind of on and off. I know a lot about EverQuest too, and I know Delman does too, so we'll talk about that. But um, SOE kind of had their phase where they sort of didn't tell players anything. Um, yes. <laughs> they, were, they were a big company. They were doing publishing of other products. They expanded like crazy. They had a Seattle studio. They had um, another studio in... Oh, I want to say like Tucson, but I believe that's incorrect. Um, and then they had their Austin studio working on Star Wars Galaxies, and then they had their San Diego studio working on the EverQuest franchise and other projects at the time. So they, they were huge. Um, they worked to create, like, Pirates of the Burning Sea. In this era, they were buying MMOs like Vanguard and Matrix Online. Um, they were trying to become a conglomerate of online games, and it kind of fell through on them. And, and there could be a couple reasons why. Maybe this overexpanded. They have like a whole studio just made for trading card games, where they're just trying to pump out all these uh, trading card games. I believe they made a, um, oh man, it's not Star Trek. It was a uh, Stargate, a Stargate trading card game. Have you guys ever heard of that? No, I No, haven't. but I want to play it. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I think, they didn't do uh, good? Apparently not. No, apparently not. I love Stargate. <laughs> I just increased my nerd cred by 10 points. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and start off with the positives of this era. Um, for me, you know, I came into EverQuest 2 right before launch, kind of like we're doing now with EverQuest Next Day, Mark. It was a huge experience for me as a 14-year-old boy, getting in the community, hanging out with people like Leon A.R. and Moorgard and stuff before they... Whatever. Yes, showing my age. And by their... Ooh. Okay. I'm the youngest person on the podcast, in case you didn't know. Who's the oldest on the podcast? Uh, I don't know how old Delmon is, but I am the oldest of the normal hosts. Okay. We'll, we'll go with that. We can still Well, now that. that's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so, me, it was the content, I think. Um, there was always something new happening. They were pushing expansion packs a lot. You know, I was okay with paying fifteen dollars a month because my parents were paying it at the time, and um, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and, and that's that's the interesting uh, comparison with what Delmon was saying is because I had been playing, uh, not playing, but I had my first experience on the internet was with AOL, um, and that was a subscription based service. You know, you, you know, log into AOL, you pay them fifteen bucks a month. Well, it used to be even worse than that. It was like five dollars an hour. You know, if you went over 100 hours or something like that, it was crazy. Um, but my mindset was that if there was something on the Internet that I wanted to have access to, I had already been accustomed to, hey, I pay for that service. Um, so the idea of having a subscription based game didn't really throw me off. It was just like, oh, OK, I, I'm OK. And, and the reason I didn't play EverQuest when it first came out isn't because of that. It was because. I was just too busy with everything else going on in my life, even though I was still what I would consider a computer gamer. I think for myself, the, the initial hesitation to pay a subscription was that we had been playing before that, I think, uh, Baldur's Gate, maybe? Icewind Dale, some D&D some &D board and board style games where you went to the store, you paid your $39.99, your $49.99, or whatever it was, and you took the box home and that was it. 
uh, and it had an online component, but you didn't have to pay for it. Uh, it was this concept of buying the box and then also constantly contributing a, a payment every month to them. Right. You know, and and now that I think about it, at that same time, um, StarCraft and Warcraft were out, not the MMOs, but the actual uh, RTS games. And you could play against your, your you could log into Battle.net in back when it was in its infancies, and you could play with your friends and with other people. And that was, and, and Blizzard offered that free. You bought the box. And you could play with one another free. Um, so, I, you know, I, again, I don't I was never quite turned off from it, but I do understand the other people who had that that hesitation that like, why am I paying for this? I bought it. Why do I now pay for it? And we see a resurgence of that when the free to play model becomes viable later. You know, League of Legends comes out. We'll talk about that a little later. But it's that same resurgence, I think. You know, people were kind of burnt out and they were saying, hey, is it worth kind of paying fifteen dollars a month? Well, I'm not really sure. Right. And, and when we talk about that, we can start looking at Pantheon, you know, that they're, they're still going forward with that project. And they're still saying that, hey, people are still willing to pay 15 bucks a month for a game that, is, that meets their expectations. Um, and yeah. they're, they're challenging that, that notion that if you're going to do a new game, it has to be free to play. Rift did the same thing. They said there's no plans for Rift to become, you know, free to play. We're happy with the subscription model. That was Scott Hartsman. He was actually the uh, lead designer, creative designer on EverQuest 2 at launch. Um, so he had an SOE background. He went to Tron Worlds after that. So we also saw Rift go free to play. So it is, it's an interesting debate. Yeah. We'll that a little later. See, um, I, yeah. I guess I'm the late bloomer in all of them because I only recently started playing video games on a pc i was a console gamer if i wasn't in a video arcade i was on a console so um i think it's only been in the last five years that i've been playing actual pc games that were subscription based um any other pc games before that would have been go to the store buy the game like neverwinter um and then never pay for the game again yeah, I mean, even for console gamers, when the Xbox, the very first Xbox came out in 2001, that their live model was pay. F you had to pay for that yearly, and that bl that was blowing people's minds, console gamers' minds. They're like, I got to pay to play online with friends, and but but it was new to the market at the time, as the console market at least. Yeah, you know what? And we have that conversation around our house too about Xbox Live. Because you have, you bought your console, you bought the game, you pay for your internet separately, but to play the box on your console online that you're already paying for, now you have to pay a third party another set of fees. And, um, you know, it's like, well, wait, 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 why are we doing that? <laughs> what, what, what sense does that make? Um, so, yeah. So, why do you yeah. think the subscription model worked? Is it because it was the only thing at the time? I mean, EverQuest was that first little graphical kind of mud. It wasn't the first. There were others out there, let's be honest. Um, but it was kind of the first of its kind in, I guess, I don't know. I was young. Can someone else discuss why SOE became, or why EverQuest became what it was? I'm sorry. Um, I would say a lot of it had to do with, I mean, at the time, he had Ultima Online. And uh, when EverQuest came out in 1999, on uh, March 16th of 1999, uh, it blew up. And and what it, what a lot of the things they were doing were like like look at the the 3D models they were doing like they opted out on having it rendered in game or have the game render it or have it, so they they forced people to buy 3D rendering cards so that pushed that market forward. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. So and uh, you know ten it was ten bucks a month if I remember correctly at the time like I I, I I'm the baby here for the SOE gaming like so just to let you know but I I do know my history so <laughs> so. Uh, um, it was 10 bucks a month people and then it just blew up like people got to play in this 3d world and like what you had at tabletop gaming was in a 3d realm and now you got to meet with people not not only your you know your friend next door or your buddies across the street you got to meet people from across the nation that like to do the same thing you did and then not only was it just like nerds and geeks and gamers it ended up being jocks and businessmen and everybody and then we could all connect through this game so when you start to have a medium like that, ten bucks a month seems viable for as much time as you put into it. I mean, ten bucks a month, break it down over how many days you play and how many hours you put in. It's probably that's 
mm -hmm. nickels and dimes. That's exactly. not, it's nothing. That's true. Um, and that was like so my background when 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 EverQuest launched, I knew that it was out there and I knew friends that played it. As a matter of fact, I was living in San Diego at the time it launched and my friends were trying to get a job at SOE. Um that was back when I was active duty Marine Corps and I was stationed just down the street from SOE's headquarters. Um, and my, my friend, um, Brian, he was, we're all gamers. That's how I knew him was actually through a, through a LARP, go figure. Um, and, and he, he found out about EverQuest and he was into computer gaming and gaming and all of that stuff. And so he went and bought it and he brought it home and he couldn't play it on his computer, um, because it didn't have the 3d rendering card. And so I remember him complaining about that. And then he went back to the store, you know, bought the, the, the video card that he needed to be able to play the game. And he play, put wow. it in and, and loaded it up. And then like a week or two later, he's just like in awe of the game. And, and I mean, that's kind of funny where we're standing at now. But at the time, he's like, look at the grass. It's moving. <laughs> and then that's like we're, you know, he, he was he was enthralled with it. And I couldn't play because I was too busy doing all my other things, but he was just, he loved that game. And for him, I think the reason he got into it so deep was just the, the depth of the game. Um, how, how deep it, how, how much you could spend trying to learn to do one specific thing. I remember him trying to learn a language and there was a whole mechanic for learning the language. And he was just one of those types of people that like, if you show him a little bit, he's going to like, I want to know everything about how to learn languages in the game. And so he'd go around and he would just experiment with it and figure out how it's done and, and how to get better the quickest at learning the language. Um, so for me, I think that that's one of the things that really got people into it was the was the like I said the graphic fidelity. Even though at the at, you know compared to right now it looks you know okay, um, but yeah. back in the day it looked you know it was mind blowing. And then the second thing was the depth of the mechanics of the in the systems that they put in the game, like learning, you know, the learning skills mechanic and all that other stuff. Uh, you know, I think what you said is truly. You know, people had not seen anything like that in a game, and I think what what also helped it, you know, really become the the hit that it was was that it put you in the driver's seat. The immersion was there, and it was you playing this character. You weren't playing a character; you were playing yourself in this world, and you were the hero. You know, so many other games before that, you moved the characters around on the screen and you interacted with the world and you you killed the bad guy. But now, but it was, let me rephrase that, it was the character killing the bad guy through your c control. Now, for the first time, you're looking through the game through your eyes, through that first person, although you don't play first person as much anymore, but <laughs> it puts you in the driver's seat, so to speak, and it really made you feel like you were the dwarf. Like, your question earlier to me was, what character do I play? Well, you had a character. You were only one, and people referred to everything else you had was an alt. Right. You identified yourself with one thing. And you really had that emergent factor and feeling and association. Really uh, had, a, for lack of better terms, emotional bond with, with the character, the, the bits on the screen. And I think that really drew people in. Because for once now, um, all the mechanics of D&D, &D, all the dice rolling and all that sort of stuff that I think scared people away, the thick books and all that, all that was handled for you by the game and you could actually play and be the hero. Yeah, and I, I think that that's one of the things that I going from a tabletop RPG to like an MMORPG is the the removal of the rules lawyering. You didn't argue huh. with over people. You didn't argue with the rules over people. Did you get many fist fights over rules? No, no, so? no, but, there, but it, it wasn't about play rock, paper, scissors a lot. <laughs> but, <laughs> Roll some more dice. But, <laughs> but, it, it wasn't so much about like that, those types of um, conflicts where it became physical or even, angry with one another but at the same time like if there was a disagreement it took the the, the flow of the game and it came to a screeching halt and what, what was worse is when it was like the 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 storyteller or the game master or the dungeon master with one of the players and they're trying to figure out what's what it, what you know what the rule means and the other players are sitting in the background going like da -da -da, could you guys figure it out because we would like to move forward and that is one of the things I love the most about MMOs is that all of that is taken care of by the server in the back end. If you can do something, the server lets you and you go. And if you can't, eh, whatever, we'll try something new next time. 
you, you know, that sort of thing. And I think that that was another one of those um, w paradigms, those paradigm shifts where where there was already this role playing community and they could just slide right into MMOs because it was everything that they wanted and it removed a couple of those elements that they didn't want. Like other people. Hey, not th those. No, those... well, no. A lot of the time, too. When you say other people, that that's people problems. So, hey, if you want to play D anD D, you have to set to meet up at a certain time. You know, you have to dedicate you know a couple hours to drive to the person's house, get everything set up, and then you have to rely on that dungeon master to create everything. I mean, you right. want to talk about the work behind a podcast? Pants. And sometimes and you, you even have to put on pants. On pants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, totally. And Kim Possible, oh, I shouldn't. Say God, I'm so candid. Kim Possible got me into EverQuest. It was 2003. They had an episode that was. Half EverQuest, half D and D, and they go into this world of Norath. It was called something else, but it was like a play on it. And so I'm like, "Oh, this is really cool!" And I started like looking it up. And then I tell my mom's boyfriend at the time that you know, for Christmas, I want EverQuest. He buys it for me. Then my mom's like, "Crap, there's a subscription to it." And I started playing on my dial-up. Um, I remember running through Calithin for the first time on my High Elf Cleric. That's what I rolled, and I was running out into a Greater Fedor and lagging everywhere you know your character would just jump back and forth and i'm like oh my god what is going on um but it was massive man i that's the biggest thing that kept me on going back to tanlin's you know construction of the game mechanics the world itself was massive so not necessarily did i have to learn a language because i was 14 at the time i didn't play for quests i didn't play for getting gear i just explored and i would sit there just running around fader forever um i ran all the way to um God, where was it? It must have been the Common Lands, and I met a dwarf that lost its way, and I'm like, have you ever been to, uh, to, um, God, the name of the Hyle City, um, Thelwith? And he's like, no, I've never been. And I'm like, hey, well, come on, buddy, let's go look at it. And so we journeyed back to Thelwith, and I taught this dwarf all about the High Elves, which I had no idea at the time was anything about him, but I created a story about it. And, you know, maybe it's its simpleness in design that really let it take off too, because it allowed those role players to sort of take that little perspective and that character and build the world around them. Today, there's a lot of hand-holding, there's a lot of design that's saying, hey, you are this character, you're in this role. But EverQuest didn't have that, and for me, it created an experience where I could kind of just explore, be who I wanted, like Delman was saying, be that hero. So, now, that, that's... There? Go ahead. Of course. I just want to make sure I understood this correctly. A Nickelodeon cartoon. A Nickelodeon cartoon. They must have had hold another on, quest player. It was. It was, it was Disney. It was. No. Even worse. It was Disney. It was Disney. It's actually Disney. But if you Disney. really want to hear something super funny, at one time I had the Kim Possible ringtone as my personal ringtone on my phone. That one. Let me just say that I am. I don't know how many years older than Chad, but quite possibly 10 or more, and I could sing the theme song from start to finish because I totally loved that cartoon. But somehow I missed that episode, but Tamlin brought something out that he wanted to show off no, because this... This is pretty. See, he even watched Kim Possible. <laughs> you guys can't laugh at me. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. My daughter watched the show. Whatever. I watched because of her. Uh -huh. <laughs> how old's your daughter? He doesn't answer this question. <laughs> I, I'm yeah. thinking, I don't, it's Flattish you have to worry about, man. <laughs> it's Flattish, okay? I'm thinking, I'm not talking for me. Well, I'm the cute guy with the beard, leave me alone! <laughs> who constantly womanizes our viewers. <laughs> He's not a womanizer. Wait, hold on, hold on. The, when, when that, the, whole, the whole thing about, um, about Kim Possible and 14-year-old boys reminded me of something. And I, I think... <laughs> if I first, wow. is listening, um, I had nothing to do with this conversation. <laughs> but the fact is, is that we... Don't actually put this on our the art, the, art of, uh, the art of EverQuest was definitely sexualized. Friona V practically wears no clothing do you think that, that that was not me but maybe some boys yeah do, do you think that that was i mean Fire. do you think that is why people came in and and, and grabbed the game at, at first and, and picked it up off the shelf 
we're talking about how they got into the market because I saw when I because I was a gamer at the time I saw no advertisements for Ultima Online I didn't even know about it or Dark Age of Camelot didn't even know about it but I knew about EverQuest and I could recognize the art like that you know I would see it and I'd be like oh yeah. it's EverQuest 2 art or not EverQuest 2 but it's EverQuest art it's Friona V everybody recognized that character and how how important do you think was it for them to establish that character and for the marketing angle to get people to to be able to recognize their product no i completely agree look at keith parkinson's artwork all of those beautiful women are bodacious like really and um it reminds me have you guys seen the early commercial from the 90s about everquest it's these two women sitting in a bar they're having like a drink they're real cool chicks really hip and they're talking about this game everquest and how cool it is because you can be a warrior you can be a wizard you can be anyone you want you know and it totally markets towards that you know kind of gamer boy who maybe wants to be cool or maybe you know wants to see those women um in a way, maybe we could say they sort of invented the whole hot avatar on the side of the MMO page that you so infamously see today. Like, yeah, play, play Civ 33 Gar Guy Got Online. I don't know. You always see that sexy woman, that art with those giant boobs hanging over the screen that are so not real. You know, maybe we could attribute that to everyone. Oh, no, those, those are real and they are spectacular. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. I, I, I got into the beta for go guy guy uh, online <laughs> so I, I would like to point out that we actually have an upcoming episode planned for this specifically to be a topic just as a heads up yeah. for anybody that would like to uh to discuss this further but if we continue talking about boobs and asses we're never gonna finish the show so it's true, true. <laughs> So I, being the one with the boobs, I'm going to derail this conversation. I'd so, like to point out I've been good. <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Actually, um, so, next episode is our Girl of Gamers episode, isn't it, Kai? It I is. It yep. Is. So I you guys stay tuned for that. Right now we're kind of, since, you know, Landmark's in its kind of alpha beta period, um, we don't really want to do like an update show where we're just talking about updates. There's plenty of that content out there. So until we start getting some more EverQuest Next news and news from both sides of the pond, we're going to kind of use this time to delve into topics. So right now we're doing SOE's Legacy. We have the Girl Gamer episode, which we don't really have a topic or a name for yet. It'll be much better than Girl Gamer episode. But that'll be coming on too, so... If you have any friends who are interested in these kind of bigger topics, be sure to tune in for those episodes because that's kind of where we're going to be aiming the show for a while. So but back to the conversation, yeah. We should, since we've talked about the positives and some of the, the things that have been going on with the, the pay model, um, the subscription, my apologies, the subscription model, we should also talk about the negatives. And yes. sadly, like I said, since Caliber isn't here tonight, um, and I always say his name wrong, it's not Caliber, it's Calbur, um, but I always butcher it, so Cal, since Cal's not here, we can't cover, um, it, at least we can't cover it well, we can't cover um, Star Wars Galaxies, but what we can talk about is Vanguard, and I'm bringing up Vanguard now, since it's the most recent game that I've been involved with and Talon's been involved with that has been announced as sunsetting. To clarify, that means they're shutting down the game, in case somebody didn't know. Um, <clears throat> and I'd also like to state that while it is really upsetting to see a sunset on a game, we're not really mad, but we really are vocal about the way it was handled by SOE. Um, and I, for one, kind of, I mean, here, I'm going to say I'm kind of pissed because I felt like suddenly they're talking about EverQuest Next and EverQuest Next Landmark, and we're going to be really super transparent about what's going on with the game. And we went to SOE Live last year, um, and I feel like the least they could have done was said, hey, if we might have to kill the game, guys, because we're really not getting a whole lot of subscribers, because I understand that subscriptions are low, and I get that. And it went free to play, and it didn't help, and I get that. But we were at SOE Live, not a word was said. And then shortly after that, it was like new community manager, releasing of several of the Vanguard employees, and not a single word was said until after the new community manager comes in and the poor poor girl gets thrown to the wolves. She's a scapegoat. I mean, she yeah. literally got guy, brought right? in and she made the announcement that the game was being sunset. So for the players' end of it, we saw 
the the employee is being streamlined and a new community manager it really seemed like oh they're gonna do something now they released a new raid sunset the same thing happened with everquest 2 everquest next even though they said didn't nothing happen they lost people as well they let go of a lot of their programmers and stuff like that who aren't like senior members of the team and you're completely right they were preaching from their pedestal about this transparent model and we're talking you know kind of recently so this is under the mood to free to play but it is sort of signifying the death of the free to play model because vanguard kind of was the last to go free to play with the company and the way they handled it um but this is bigger than just those two games because it talks about the same thing their their biggest bonus to me is being a business you know smed's a businessman he's good at acquiring products he's he's good at utilizing those things but at the same time there's a business side to soe that does the opposite it excommunicates the player base in certain ways um it lies straight up because let's be honest that's a lie you know you're saying you're being transparent about your company and then you're not even telling your own employees at, that are at SOE Live last year that they were getting let go. You know, they come back, and then a few weeks later, it's like, sorry, guys, we're going to have to do layoffs. Um, and we've seen this happen a couple times over SOE, just from the layoff perspective. And then on top of the game perspective, S SWG, new player experience. Or it, it was NGE, right? So that was new... New game experience. New, new, new game, game experience. experience. New game experience. Well, it, they didn't listen to the community. Um, and there's a couple times they've done this, and they just chose to go ahead and push on, thinking that they knew what was better for the product. I think you guys could talk all on and on about this. So I'll open up the floor well, for you guys. Well, on the one hand, this I, I I've seen, and it's not just with SOE, um, with with the rise of social media in general, and especially um, Twitter and Twitch, um that companies are much more accessible like from the developers if like I, I i don't just follow soe developers on my on my twitter i have some treon some blizzard um some soe and and a couple others and and the great thing about twitter is that if you can get a concise question into 140 characters that they can understand and answer in 140 characters they're so much more likely to do it because it's it's just that short little message you have a question you ask it they have the answer they give it and i, I i'm the, this is not just about soe it's like a lot of game companies are are acknowledging the power of this how how good it is to have that little bit of cus, con, consumer not customer consumer interaction but at the same time it's like we uh, they you know we we can appreciate that they're interacting with us but at the same time they're still holding all of those cards closer to the vest you know so that we can't peek um and i think it's yeah, understandable to a way right it is i mean but it business makes me decisions a little... are business decisions right right and you don't definitely don't want to do that but at the same time i was like well you know i showed up at, at at vanguard and what they were showing were they bluffing me were they when they when they were showing me this is your team and these are your you know these are the plans moving forward and then the next month it seemed like okay round of layoffs but you know they haven't said anything um, they're talking about, you know, you know, what, what, what's the plan going forward? And we didn't really hear anything about that. And then in January or February, I forget which they did a developer spotlight on one of the Vanguard developers. And we're like, okay, that's good. New community manager the following month. That's great. And then bam, shutting it down. Like, and it's like, well, whoa, 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 Hey, a little bit of communication would have been great right there because we'd have been, we'd, we'd have known about it. We'd have been able to prepare for it. So I, I understand that. That sometimes you 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 want to, but where is SOE really at in regards to that transparency? Is that you can do a lot of mirrors and be like, we're being transparent, and we're telling you everything that we're doing, and then at the same time, it's like, nope. <laughs> uh, well, I think there's there's two there's two sides to that coin there. Um, the, when the, when they my my guess is when they're talking about transparency, they're talking about uh, game mechanics, future updates, uh, things that we as players or consumers see on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, where do you get the big shiny sword to kill the big orc dragon type of thing and all that. Uh, but then there's the other side, which is the, the, the business side. Um, and when you're talking about, uh, you know, changes in staff alignments and reductions and workforce and that sort of stuff, um, we see them as devs. We see those those individuals as red names. And it's it's easy to 
sit in our chairs as the consumer um, with the Monday morning quarterback mentality. Say that they're not being transparent, but remember they are a business uh, and that those are individuals and those are people's careers and there's, you know, there are mortgage payments that they might have difficulty making and whatnot. So um, those are those are business decisions and usually have very little to do with the with the guys on the front lines, the guys on the podiums, and the guys and the, the guys and gals up there who are answering your questions about why can't my paladin do this sort of thing. Um, you know, so to say that they're not being transparent, well, that's that's an HR, a bean counters, business, uh, continuity, those sorts of types of people who are making those decisions and not the front line red names that we see day-to-day -day basis as players so um, I think when you talk about transparency SOE as an organization has come a long way uh, when it comes to players uh, ignoring the whole business side they're never going to talk about that they don't like to talk about their numbers they don't like to talk about uh, their development uh, or, or, or resources and stuff like that but if you go way back to you know EverQuest and you talk about the gates of discord and the omens of war expansions where I think SOE's hubris, where they were just making money hand over fist and could do no wrong and just started making decisions, um, really came back to bite them. And I think that they've come a long way in those sorts of uh, since those days and changed their their level of communication. They're never ever going to change it on their business side. That's just the way they operate. Well, I wouldn't say they're ever, ever going to. Pinapod makes a good point. She said, you know, it's not necessarily it's a conspiracy. It's a fight to keep the game alive. You can see that with Vanguard. They put Steve Denuser, they brought him back right after the the, the mess, um, another game. Um, and they, they put him on the project. And they're like, hey, you know, we're going to do this big free-to-play revival. Let's see if we can really push it. You know, let's, let's try and do something. Because you never want to see a game you've put money into fail from a business point. And then from a dev point, you spend all these years developing the storyline. And, and you think players get immersed in the environment think about the developers who are creating the world just like in alpha you know in landmark when your build gets wiped how do you feel well if you put those hours into it it's it's devastating um so i think that's a great point but i will say that i do feel that soe is trying to bring about their communication in-house um in a better way at, at least how it's presented to us so we have things like, oh, we're changing our subscription plan. That's something that never would have happened. That conversation on Reddit between Smedley and the Planet Side 2 community, that never would have happened, say, 10 years ago. You know, right. SOE was a very different beast. But one of the criticisms is Reddit the place to have that discussion. Because I it's have an open forum. Why not? Because I have friends and family that don't go to Reddit, that don't they don't have Twitter, they don't they have they barely have Facebook. Um, but they're paying to play these games. And so like where, and I'm not saying that Reddit is not absolutely not the place to have it. I'm just th throwing that question out there. Is Reddit the appropriate place to have that sort of conversation? Um, so, and if not, where is, and how do you let the, um, the people who are only logging in to play the game and pay you money? How do you let them know that, Hey, we want your, you, you know, we want to have a conversation with you. You know, how yeah, do you put, I agree, how do you but I, I think they are already addressing this to a point. Um, they've seen that there's been a lot of retaliation over, hey, you're using Twitter and not the forums. We all have seen that from every uh -huh. single community. EverQuest right, right. 2, you know, they're like, why the hell are you not talking to your player base? And they're like, well, forums are hard as hell to read and keep up and use because people write these long, like, 15-page <laughs> little posts. Um, and so it, it makes sense to me why they want to use Reddit and Twitter talking about, you know, the kind of evolution of social media. Um, but I think they're also addressing this with Landmark and how they're going about combining the Reddit and the Twitter experience with the forums. I think they're doing a lot better of job, you know, posting things on the forums and linking it to it. So that's my opinion. I don't know if you all feel the same way about that. But I think they're trying to do it. I definitely think they're trying to do it. Um, and someone made a point in chat earlier that, you know, transparency between a game and development and transparency between the business is very different, yes. Um, and I think that's why they've had kind of problems, because their, their rhetoric is really strong when it comes to transparency, and their marketing practices are phenomenal. You know, they push that experience, they have great slogans, you're in our world now. Um, they've always been great at marketing their products. The problem is is that when their marketing says something or Smedley does an interview and leaks something and then it doesn't come true. You know, it doesn't 
it doesn't happen that way because business plans change. Well, something on the internet doesn't change. That article from a few months ago is going to stay the same thing. So, you know, you were saying earlier about um, them saying that they're doing the whole revival of Vanguard and then they laid off their employees. Well, I think that's a problem with their in-house communications. Like you were saying, Delman, about the... Sorry, I'm switching from Tamla to Delman. Um, but what you were saying about the... Um, Blah, the front man guy. If you improve in-house communication, then you can say, hey, these plans have changed. And you can kind of see them doing that with Landmark a bit. Dave Georgeson, you know, he's the director of development for the EverQuest franchise. Yet he's all over social media updates for Landmark. You know, he's like, guys, these are the plans that are changing. Yes, we said this, but this is how it's going about. We're having to change course because of this. We're having to change course because of that. And if they can continue this kind of trend because they are a growing company and they have been improving and they've been changing and adapting over the years. I think if they can continue that, then they could be, I don't know, one of the best MMO companies around as far as community engagement. I know Flatus is new to the community and um, I mean, Tan, Tan, Tan and Kyles kind of too. Well, Vanguard, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I've been, I've no? been with okay. Vanguard since 2007. My, oh, okay. I, I mean, but that's one of the things is in, in that, okay, there are people that are playing Landmark right now that I have to act, I, I act like the ambassador. And sometimes I do that willingly doing the podcast, but sometimes it's like, you know, hey, I just saw this tweet from Dave and this is me saying it. Hey, I just saw this tweet from the developers and this is what it said. And I have to act like the courier of the information. Um, and I don't do that as a podcaster. I do that as a friend of a person who doesn't have Twitter. And then they have questions about the tweet. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, man. And it's, it's you know, is this, that the I still think that there needs to be a little bit more way in, in of of where to get the the up to date information on on whatever game and I'm not talking about landmark or everquest next I'm talking about the the games in general um so somebody said that you know about the was reddit being the appropriate place you know if if Smedley feels comfortable having that conversation on Reddit, then that's the appropriate place. Well, what about the people who don't feel comfortable using Reddit that have been paying for an MMO they've been playing for years, for, 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 for five years, they've been paying every month. And they're like, I'm not comfortable having a Reddit account because there are those people. They, does that, because Smedley thinks it's appropriate, does that make it more appropriate? You know, I, and I, I get that there's a, a number balancing here, but then there's also that, you know, that, that the consumer, the customer feels like a stakeholder. I've paid you money for this many years. I don't feel like I'm a major stakeholder or, or, you know, bigger than the game itself, but I feel like I, I have a little stake in this, this game and it's a little bit of me that's in the game and I would like to be acknowledged and respected a little bit. And I, I'm sorry. Right. And again, if you're if you're watching um, the Twitch stream right now, my camera froze. I mentioned that in chat. I have a very introspective pose. I kind of like it. <laughs> but, but I just wanted to let people know that you know my lips aren't moving. <laughs> it's the reverse pulling a Tamlin. So I'm. I I want to add a couple of things because I feel like it potentially could be important. I'm not as. An amendment, an addition, I, I don't know. But to my comments earlier about the whole Vanguard thing and wishing I would have known more, I, I I guess when I say I wish I would have understood more of what was going on, wasn't that I wanted them to come and be like, so this is the money issues. It was like, if they would have just told the players, we're getting way too low, and I understand that they might not have been able to, that doesn't make me not want them to. So that's really the clarification that I want to make. Just because you can't doesn't mean I don't want it. But from a business point of view, if you can't, you can't. Yeah. But at least I would have felt like I was involved. And then I could have gone and told all of my friends about the game and see if I could have drawn in a couple of players. Then I would have felt like I was involved in trying to save the game rather than just playing it and getting it popped on me. So really, when I say that it's really crappy the way it was handled, it's more of a, I'm frustrated because it happened and I didn't even get the chance to help. That's really what it is. Yeah, that, I mean, it's one of those difficult lines when communicating about, you know, like your business portfolio. Like, yeah, we have this dying game over here, but we're making EverQuest next. Well, then people are like, well, if their other games are failing, why should I even consider EverQuest next? Yeah. And 
it is a fine line, but you're right because communication at the same time, if they could find a way to say, hey, you know, it doesn't have to be a complete truth, but hey, you know, it's an old game. We're trying this out. If they made that forum post that's saying, hey, we're trying this free to play to really try and boost engagement in the game and try and make something new of it. Yeah, they were doing their marketing side, but I don't know if they were really doing their community outreach side. I don't follow the game. Um, but I did want to address forums real quick. And because we're on that topic of Reddit versus the forums, Reddit to me is a public site and I think it benefits the consumer a little bit. You're right, Tamlin, in that, you know, yeah, you have to have a Reddit account. Um, sure, most things get posted to the forums afterwards, but is your feedback being taken on the forums? And that's important. I think Delman might have something to talk about here too. And EverQuest too, you know, during the whole free to play transition and, and certain, you know, topics that were going on in the community that were very, um, very bellicose in nature, like people were frustrated, they were upset. They'd make these mega conglomerate posts. There's two things they do. They make these big posts and say, post your feedback here and we're going to route it all through there. And you're like, wow, okay, good. They're taking our feedback. But then nothing's changed about it later on. It, it kind of became, yeah, maybe they were taking our feedback, but nothing came of it. So are you just corralling our opinions in one area and then getting rid of them? Um, that always frustrated me a lot when it came to forums. And then there was also forum like modding. Yeah, Reddit mods things, but you're probably going to have more of an honest perspective on something that's not controlled by the company than you are on the forums themselves. Because in EverQuest 2 too, we've seen a lot of time periods, you know, oh yeah, the ProSieben thing, there was a lot of forum modification, modding going on, sorry, modification. Um, I guess it is modification, but whatever. You saw these times where they were basically going around like the Gestapo and just deleting posts. And those posts were very iffy on if they were actually breaking the TOS. We're not talking about things that actually broke the TOS, but things that might have maybe been in gray area that were all of a sudden gone. Um, I don't know if you want to chime in here a little, Dallin, about that. Oh, well, if, let me, if let you've me see seen that too. Yeah, let me say this about the forums. Let me ask a question. How many people remember when SOE didn't even actually have forums? You know, so talk about, talk about that's part of the equation too. At one point, they didn't even have them. And uh, the, the players in the community, and that's where a lot of fan sites, I think, in that EverQuest timeline really took ownership and, and took care of it themselves. I mean, there were, there were forums and websites dedicated to each specific uh, class or zone or ser and server. I mean, there were so many different places on the, on the internet where you went to go and get your information about the one game, the one, the one EverQuest game, uh, depending on how you played. Uh, you know, they, I, I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing that they didn't provide that service. Uh, then they kind of bring it around and people start to participate in it. Uh, again, it's a corporate entity, so of course they're going to uh, mod it to their to their likings. They have to, uh, and I yeah. think over, over the years they have been. Um, it has been a bit of a roller coaster, and I think depending too on on the individual modder at the time. Uh, you, you know what one one person's claim is another person's treasure. I guess you could say perhaps. Um, so I think you know over time things have shifted back and forth. Um, you know, I think as myself, I've always thought, gee, if you're going to do those sorts of communications, do it on your own entity. Uh, yeah. Don't rely on on uh, Twitters or Facebooks or Reddits or things like that. Have that technology in your own house to do it there. Be the one-stop shop. Don't make your customers go all over creation to find it um, and, and consume it that way. Um, because you get into that, well, I don't like Facebook uh, attitudes, or I don't have this this social media tool, so I don't use uh, Tumblr or, or something like that. So um, uh, people get this, this vibe of that the company's not listening to them if they don't use that particular medium. So my belief is to always bring it in-house and, and do it on your own terms. Uh, SOE as an organization doesn't seem to really have that. Uh, they seem to sometimes latch on to the latest and greatest. How long did their Vine account last? I don't know. Do, do they even still have one? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I, what's the picture sharing one? I can't even think of its name at the moment. Uh, 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 the, in Instagram. Instagram. Oh, no. Imager. Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Instagram. 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 Thank you. Instagram. Instagram. Yes, thank you. They, they use it for planet side, kind of. Right, but, but so yeah, they, they catch on to these, but whether or not, you know, Twitter and Facebook seem to have been the, the two social medias that have kind of stood out and, and lasted. 
Um, but again, if it was in-house and, and you can control it and you managed it, uh, I think it would be a lot better because I do believe in the one-stop shop. All right. So really quick, the, the, the last thing I want to say is we really, <coughs> sorry, really want to say that we're not trying to like bash on SOE because clearly we're doing a podcast that is Are you about, kidding? Like, I hate that comment. Two, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> just, just shut up. About two specific SOE games. So we're not really trying to bash on it. We just have opinions, and sometimes we're pretty sugary coated polite, but sometimes we can't be because we're opinionated a holes sometimes. But I would like to say that we need to take our break, but we will be back in about five five minutes, ten minutes. What are we doing? Five, five, yeah, five, five. five minute break. Um, and then we'll have one hour uh, for after hours. Yeah, I think we have a couple more to discuss on this topic real quick, and then we'll kind of yeah. move into a more relaxed uh, discussion. But fun definitely. stuff. Fun stuff. Because <laughs> I have fun stuff. Make my soul cry because really you... I feel super bad. Really? Do you guys know how bad I just want to start bringing in like communication? I'm a 